Hi there. Today we're going to talk about energy conservation. We have two goals. First, hey, we'll just start talking about it, see what it is, and then we're going to apply the idea of energy conservation to a particular situation, just to see how it works. So first of all, we should talk about what are called conservative forces. So a conservative force, a good example of it, is a force like gravity. So if you think about gravity, let's say you take an object, just a ball or something, and you throw it straight up into the air. When that ball, so you release the ball with a particular amount of kinetic energy, when it comes back to you, if you catch it at the same height, and we can neglect air resistance, then it comes back to you with exactly the same amount of kinetic energy. Right On the way up, all the kinetic energy disappears and turns into gravitational potential energy, but then gravity gives you all the energy back. On the way down, that gravitational potential energy gradually turns back into kinetic energy. So we say this is a reversible process, right? So all the energy comes back again. And that's true again if gravity is the only force acting on it. So a round trip returns the kinetic energy to its original value. So that's a good example of a conservative force. So other examples of forces that do this are the uh, electrostatic force, forces between charges, and we'll talk about that in PY106. And later on this semester, we'll talk about forces associated with springs. And springs, if you have an object uh, attached to a spring, you can pull the, uh, the spring out, that thing will oscillate on the spring, and you've got this exchange of energy between kinetic and, and, and potential energy. It's a type of potential energy there, too, in that system. So the force provided by a spring is often viewed as a conservative force as well. So there's another, another example there. Now, many forces are non-conservative. Okay, so those forces tend to change the kinetic energy if you have a round trip. Uh, some of them reduce kinetic energy. good example of that is kinetic friction. Kinetic friction is unbelievably good at taking kinetic energy away. Now, what it does is it transforms it generally into thermal energy. Things heat up because of kinetic friction. However, non-conservative forces can also add kinetic energy to systems, such as car engines or rocket engines, or things like that. Even tension, in some cases, can be a non-conservative force because you can pull on a system, it could be at rest, pull on it with a string, and add kinetic energy to the system. So, the reason we're talking about conservative forces is that we generally handle with energy, we handle conservative forces differently from the way we handle non-conservative forces. Okay, what we do is we define potential energies for conservative forces, and non-conservative forces, we look at the work that they do. So we handle them in different ways. Okay, so we'll start with this. This is called the principle of conservation of mechanical energy. Well, what's mechanical energy? It's simply the sum of the kinetic plus the potential energy. Okay, so if the total mechanical energy remains constant, okay, then mechanical energy is conserved. However, this is only true that total mechanical energy remains constant if the network done by non-conservative forces, such as friction, is zero. Okay, so this works in some cases and doesn't work in other cases. If you got friction involved or engines providing uh, inputs of energy, then it doesn't work. So it's a very special case. Now, this statement, the law of conservation of energy, is a far, far stronger statement than the principle of the conservation of mechanical energy. Okay? So this applies basically all the time, all over the universe. If you ever have an example of energy not being conserved, then uh, you really got to look at whether you've done some in totally new physics and deserve a Nobel Prize, or maybe you just made a mistake in your analysis. So we probably all heard this statement before. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed, but can only be converted from one form to another. So you can have transformations of energy. But if you really define your system uh, very carefully, and you've got no energy coming in from outside or exchanging with the outside world, 
then your total energy system-wide should be conserved. So here's an equation that we generally use and we can apply this equation in all sorts of energy situations. When we get to rolling things later on in the course, we'll change our definition of kinetic energy, but we can still use this equation. When we do springs and we've got a new type of potential energy, we'll build it into this equation, but the starting point here, this five-term equation, will still work. When we go to PY 106 next semester and look at charges, again, we'll have a different form of potential energy. We'll use it in this system and this equation, and it'll work fine. So let's see what all these terms mean. So U is generally our symbol for potential energy. I means initial, F means final. So UI and UF are the initial and final potential energies. Then we have similar terms for KI and KF. Those are the initial and final kinetic energies. Okay. Work NC, NC stands for non-conservative. So WNC is the work done by non-conservative forces. Once again, we're treating conservative forces differently from non-conservative forces. Non-conservative forces, if there are any, we handle through this WNC term in the equation. If we have conservative forces, then we define potential energies for them, and we build them into the energy equation using the initial and final values of the potential energy. Let's think about this WNC term. It can be, sometimes it's zero. It can certainly be negative. For instance, when kinetic friction is extracting mechanical energy from the system, really transforming that energy into, in many ways, less useful forms, uh, generally thermal energy. And WNC can often be positive as well. For instance, if you were adding energy to the system by pulling on a string or there's some motor, uh, feeding energy into the system. But of course that energy comes from you know burning gasoline and things like that. So if you build that into the system you're still conserving energy. You're not breaking the law of energy conservation by using a, an engine in your car for instance. Okay so what we're going to do is uh, try and see how this equation works for us. Okay, So let's consider this question here. Three identical balls are launched with the same initial speed from the top of the cliff. Okay, so they're really launched from exactly the same point with exactly the same speed. What's different about them is the direction of the initial velocity at launch. So ball A just has an initial velocity directed horizontal. Ball B, its initial velocity is directed 20 degrees below the horizontal and ball C has an initial velocity directed 40 degrees above the horizontal. They're all ultimately going to hit the ground. They don't hit the ground at the same time, but when each one hits the ground, or just before impact with the ground, that's what we really mean, which ball has the highest speed? Okay, so think about you measure the speed of A just before impact compared to the speed of B just before its impact with the ground, compared to the speed of C just before its impact with the ground. So think about A, how we would handle this problem, how would we figure it out, knowing uh, what we've learned so far in the course. What do you think? Ball A, ball B, ball C, or is it equal for all three? Okay, so when we've asked this question in the past, uh, ball C is actually a very popular answer. And you can understand why. Because you say, well, ball C is the one that's going to end up going the highest of all. Okay? So ball A never gets higher than the launch point. Ball, neither does ball B. Okay? It's directed down. Ball C goes up at some point, reaches some highest point which is definitely higher than A or B, and then comes down. Okay, so thinking about that, you might think that ball C should hit the ground with the highest speed. Okay, what we're going to do here is, instead of doing a projectile motion analysis, which we'll talk about a little bit later, we're going to do an energy analysis. Okay, so here's our law of conservation of energy. You just start with this five-term equation, and 
what you usually do is then toss out terms you don't need. Okay, so we'll think about which, which terms we don't have to worry about in this particular problem. So first of all, we're going to do our usual thing and neglect air resistance. And then we've just got the only thing acting on the ball during its flight is uh, gravity, the force of gravity. And we'll handle that using the potential energy, gravitational potential energy. So there's no work being done by non-conservative forces. So we just get rid of that term. The other term we can get rid of is this final potential energy. If we define the ground level as u equals zero. Okay, so they all ultimately reach the ground. So let's call, and that's the lowest level we have in this particular problem. So it's often convenient to define the lowest level as the, where the potential energy, gravitational potential energy is zero. Okay, you're free to define your zero level whenever you, wherever you want. Okay, but in this case, I think it's very convenient to do it at the ground level. So that reduces our five term equation down to three terms. So now we're going to think about how these three terms compare. So what our equation says is that the final kinetic energy, and remember what we're interested in is how fast are the balls going when they hit the ground. So that's absolutely directly tied into the final kinetic energy because that's one half mv final squared. So here we have the final kinetic energy connected to the initial potential, initial gravitational potential, plus the initial kinetic. Well, how do those terms compare? Well, they all start at the same place. Okay, so their initial potential energy is the same. Hmm, what else is the same? Well, they're all launched with the same speed. See, kinetic energy couldn't care less about direction. You don't have to worry about direction when you're dealing with energy. Uh, now, that sometimes you do when you're dealing with work. Okay, that determines the sign on the work. But here, for kinetic energy, it's just one half mvi squared. Doesn't matter which way that's directed. Okay, so you get the same initial potential energy, same initial kinetic energy. So what must you conclude about the final kinetic energy? It's got to be the same. Okay? The left-hand side's the same for all three balls. The right-hand side's got to be the same for all three balls. Okay. Let's take this a little further. Okay, we have did this. It's just a repeat of what we did on the previous slide. Let's expand these terms out a little bit. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to say mgh is our initial gravitational potential energy. h is the height of the cliff above our zero level. Okay, all balls were launched from the same place. They're all launched with the same initial kinetic energy, one-half mvi squared, and therefore they must have the same uh, final kinetic energy, one-half mvf squared. Now, doesn't it matter what the mass of the balls are? What do you think? Well, let's see. There's an m in every term, so the mass cancels out. It doesn't matter what the mass is. These balls can have completely different masses, and that has no impact on what the final speed is, just before impact with the ground. Okay, so then we come down. We're going to multiply our equation through by 2 and divide by an m. So we get 2gh plus vi squared is vf squared, and that's the same for all the balls. Okay, so very quickly, energy leads us to this conclusion that all three balls hit with the, with the same speed. And in fact, if we did it for any launch angle, it's the same energy analysis, so the launch angle is irrelevant. Now the only other way we really know to solve this problem is to do a projectile motion analysis. Okay, So this is what we learned again using energy. We learned A, all three balls had the same final speed. True for any launch angle. Okay, so we wouldn't have to do the problem again if one of the angles was changed to 50 degrees or 17.2 or whatever. All the same energy analysis. And balls of any mass, it all works too. If we were to solve using projectile motion methods, what we'd do is we'd break up everything into x and y components, and we'd have to do three problems, right? One for each ball. Ball A would have to do one way. Ball B, it's a whole different set of x and y initial velocities. Ball C, totally different, okay? So A would take a lot longer, and B, it would not be nearly so obvious that the answer is that any launch angle, no matter what, gives the same speed for the balls when it hits the ground, okay? Now we can certainly get things out of projectile motion that we can't get out of energy. 
But for this particular question, compare the speeds upon impact just before impact with the ground. Energy analysis is far superior. It's much easier, much more general. It's a very powerful tool for us to add to our toolbox to, in order to analyze physical situations. Okay, so that is it for our introduction to energy conservation.